dot org. The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. Act Three. Scene One. Venice, a street. Enter Salanio and Salarino. Now, what news on the Rialto? Why, yet it lives there unchecked that Antonio hath a ship of rich lading wrecked on the narrow seas, the good ones I think they call the place, a very dangerous flat and fatal, where the carcasses of many a tall ship lie buried, as they say, if my gossip report be an honest woman of her word. I would she were as lying a gossip in that as ever napped ginger or made her neighbors believe she wept for the death of a third husband, but it is true— without any slips of prolixity or crossing the plain highway of talk, that the good Antonio, the honest Antonio, oh, that I had a title good enough to keep his name company. Come, the full stop. Ha, what sayest thou? Why, the end is, he hath lost a ship. I would it might prove the end of his losses. Let me say amen betimes, lest the devil cross my prayer, for here he comes in the likeness of a Jew. Enter Shylock. You knew... None so well, none so well as you of my daughter's flight. That's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew withal. And Shylock, for his own part, knew the bird was fledged, and then it is the complexion of them all to leave the dam. She is damned for it. That's certain, if the devil may be her judge. My own flesh and blood to rebel. Out upon it, old carrion! Rebels it at these years? I say my daughter is my flesh and my blood. There is more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory, more between your bloods than there is between red wine and Rhenish. But tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? There I have another bad match, a bankrupt, a prodigal, who dare scarce show his head on the Rialto, a beggar that used to come so smug upon the mart. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to lend money for a Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. Why, I am sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? To bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me, and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies. And what is reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge! If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge! The villainy you teach me I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Enter a servant. A gentleman, my master Antonio is at his house, and desires to speak with you both. We have been up and down to seek him. Enter Tibble. Here comes another of the tribe. A third cannot be matched unless the devil himself turned Jew. Exeunt. Salanio, Salarino, and servant. How now, Tibul? What news from Genoa hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, but cannot find her. Why, there, 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 there. 
A diamond's gone. Cost me two thousand ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell upon our nation till now. I never felt it till now. Two thousand ducats in that and other precious, precious jewels. I would my daughter were dead at my foot and the jewels in her ear. Would she would hurst at my foot and the ducats in her coffin. No news of them. Why so? And I know not what's spent in the search. Why thou loss upon loss. The thief gone with so much and so much to find the thief. And no satisfaction, no revenge, no, no ill luck stirring but what lights on my shoulders, no sighs but of my breathing, no tears but of my shedding. Yes, other men have ill luck too. Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What, what, what? Ill luck, ill luck. Hath an argosy cast away, coming from Tripolis. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. Is it true? Is it true? I spoke with some of the sailors that escaped the wreck. Oh, I thank thee, good Tibble. Good news, good news. <laughs> Where? In Genoa. Your daughter spent in Genoa, as I heard, one night, four score ducats. Oh, thou sticks a dagger in me. I shall never see my gold again. Four score ducats at a sitting, four score ducats. There came divers of Antonio's creditors to my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I am very glad of it. I'll plague him. I'll torture him. I am glad of it. One of them showed me a ring that he had of your daughter for a monkey. Oh, out upon her. Thou torturest me, Tibble. It was my turquoise. I had it of Leia when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. But Antonio is certainly undone. Nay, that's true, that's very true. Go, Tibble, fee me an officer, bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. For were he out of Venice, I can make but merchandise I will. Go, Tibble, and meet me at our synagogue. Go, good Tibble, at our synagogue, Tibble. Exeunt. Scene two. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Enter Bassanio, Portia, Gratiano, Nerissa, and attendants. I pray you tarry. Pause a day or two before you hazard, for in choosing wrong I lose your company. Therefore forbear a while. There's something tells me, but it is not love, I would not lose you. And you know yourself hate counsels not in such a quality. But lest you should not understand me well, and yet a maiden hath no tongue but thought, I would detain you here some month or two before you venture for me. I could teach you how to choose right, but then I am forsworn. So will I never be. So may you miss me. But if you do, you'll make me wish a sin that I had been forsworn. Beshrew your eyes. They have o'erlooked me and divided me. One half of me is yours, the other half yours. Mine own, I would say, but if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Oh, these naughty times puts bars between the owners and their rights. And so, though yours, not yours. Prove it so. Let fortune go to hell for it, not I. I speak too long, but tis to pease the time, to eke it and to draw it out in length to stay you from election. Let me choose, for as I am I live upon the rack. Upon the rack, Bassanio. Then confess what treason there is mingled with your love. None but that ugly treason of mistrust which makes me fear the enjoying of my love. There may as well be amity and life tween snow and fire as treason and my love. Ay, but I fear you speak upon the rack, where men enforced do speak anything. 
Promise me life, and not confess the truth. Well, then, confess and live. Confess and love had been the very sum of my confession. O oh, happy torment, when my torturer doth teach me answers for deliverance! But let me to my fortune and the caskets. Away, then. I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find me out. Nerissa and the rest stand all aloof. Let music sound while he doth make his choice. Then, if he lose, he makes a swan-like end fading in music. That the comparison may stand more proper, my eye shall be the stream and watery deathbed for him. He may win. And what is music then? Then music is even as the flourish when true subjects bow to a new-crowned monarch. Such it is, as are those dulcet sounds in break of day that creep into the dreaming bridegroom's ear and summon him to marriage. Now he goes, with no less presence, but with much more love, than young Alcides, when he did redeem the virgin tribute paid by howling Troy to the sea-monster. I stand for sacrifice. The rest aloof are the Dardanian wives, with bleared visages come forth to view the issue of the exploit. Go, Hercules! Live thou, I live. With much, much more dismay I view the fight than thou that makes the fray. A song, while Bassanio comments on the caskets to himself. Tell me where is fancy bread, or in the heart or in the head. How be he gaunt, how nourished? Reply, reply. It is engendered in the eyes. With gazing fed and fancy dies In the cradle where it lies Let us all ring fancy's knell I'll begin it Ding dong bell Ding dong bell. So may the outward shows be least to themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. In law, what plea so tainted and corrupt, but being seasoned with a gracious voice, obscures the show of evil? In religion, what damned error but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament? There is no vice so simple but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. How many cowards, whose hearts are all as false as stairs of sand, wear yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who inward searched have livers white as milk, and these assume but valor's excrement to render them redoubted. Look on beauty, and you shall see tis purchased by the weight, which therein works a miracle in nature, making them lightest that wear most of it. So were those crisped snaky golden locks, which make such wanton gambols with the wind, upon supposed fairness, often known to be the dowry of a second head, the skull that bred them in the sepulchre. Thus ornament is but the guileed shore to a most dangerous sea, the beauteous scarf veiling an Indian beauty. In a word, the seeming truth which cunning times put on to entrap the wisest. Therefore, thou gaudy gold, hard food for Midas, I will none of thee, nor none of thee, thou pale and common drudge tween man and man. But thou, thou meagre lead, which rather threatenest than dost promise aught, thy plainness moves me more than eloquence, 
and here choose I. Joy be the consequence. Aside. How all the other passions fleet to air, as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair, and shuddering fear and green-eyed jealousy. O oh, love, be moderate, allay thy ecstasy, in measure reign thy joy, scant this excess. I feel too much thy blessing, make it less, for fear I surfeit. What find I here? Opening the leaden casket. Fair Portia's counterfeit. What demigod hath come so near creation? Move these eyes, or whether riding on the balls of mine seem they in motion. Here are severed lips, parted with sugar breath. So sweet a bar should sunder such sweet friends. Here in her hairs the painter plays the spider and hath woven a golden mesh to entrap the hearts of men faster than gnats in cobwebs. But her eyes, how could he see to do them? Having made one, methinks it should have power to steal both his and leave itself unfurnished. Yet look how far the substance of my praise doth wrong this shadow in underprising it, so far this shadow doth limp behind the substance. Here's the scroll, the continent and summary of my fortune. You that choose not by the view, chance as fair and choose as true. Since this fortune falls to you, be content and seek no new. If you be well pleased with this and hold your fortune for your bliss, turn to where your lady is and claim her with a loving kiss. A gentle scroll. Fair lady, by your leave. Kissing her. I come by note to give and to receive, like one of two contending in a prize, the things he hath done well in people's eyes, hearing applause and universal shout, giddy in spirit, still gazing in a doubt whether these pearls of praise be his or no. So, thrice, fair lady, stand I, even so, as doubtful whether what I see be true, until confirmed, signed, ratified, by you. You see me, Lord Bassanio, where I stand, such as I am. Though for myself alone I would not be ambitious in my wish to wish myself much better, yet for you I would be trebled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair, ten thousand times more rich, that only to stand high in your account I might in virtues, beauties, livings, friends exceed account. But the full sum of me is sum of something which, to term in gross, is an unlessened girl, unschooled, unpractised, happy in this, she is not yet so old but she may learn, happier than this she is not bred so dull but she can learn, happiest of all is that her gentle spirit commits itself to yours to be directed as from her lord, her governor, her king. Myself and what is mine to you and yours is now converted. But now I was the lord of this fair mansion, master of my servants, queen or myself. And even now, but now this house, these servants, and this same myself are yours, my lords. I give them with this ring, which when you part from, lose or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love, and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Madam, you've bereft me of all words. Only my blood speaks to you in my veins, and there is such confusion in my powers, as after some oration fairly spoke by a beloved prince there doth appear among the buzzing pleased multitude, where every something being blent together turns to a wild of nothing, save of joy expressed and not expressed. But when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. Oh, then be bold to say, Bassanio's dead. 
"'My lord and lady, it is now our time that have stood by and seen our wishes prosper to cry. Good joy. Good joy, my lord and lady.' "'My lord Bassanio and my gentle lady, I wish you all the joy that you can wish, for I am sure that you can wish none from me. And when your honors mean to solemnize the bargain of your faith, I do beseech you even at that time I may be married too.' With all my heart, so thou canst get a wife. I thank your lordship. You have got me one. My eyes, my lord, can look as swift as yours. You saw the mistress. I beheld the maid. You loved, I loved. For intermission no more pertains to me, my lord, than you. Your fortune stood upon the caskets there, and so did mine, too, as the matter falls. For wooing here until I sweat again, and swearing till my very roof was dry with oaths of love, at last, if promise last, I got a promise of this fair one here to have her love, provided that your fortune achieved her mistress. Is this true, Nerissa? Madame, it is. So you stand pleased with all. And do you, Graciano, mean good faith? Yes, faith, my lord. Our feast shall be much honored in your marriage. We'll play with them the first boy for a thousand ducats. What? And stake down? No, we shall ne'er win at that sport and stake down. But who comes here? Lorenzo and his infidel? What, and my old Venetian friend Salanio? Enter Lorenzo, Jessica, and Salanio. Lorenzo and Salanio, welcome hither. If that the youth of my new interest here have power to bid you welcome, by your leave I bid my very friends and countrymen sweet Portia welcome. So do I, my lord. They are entirely welcome. I thank your honor. For my part, my lord, my purpose was not to have seen you here. But meeting with Salanio, by the way, he did entreat me past all saying nay to come with him along. I did, my lord, and I have reason for it. Signor Antonio commends him to you. Gives Bassanio a letter. Ere I ope his letter, I pray you, tell me how my good friend doth. Not sick, my lord, unless it be in mind, nor well, unless in mind, his letter there will show you his estate. Nerissa, cheer yon stranger, bid her welcome. Your hand, Salanio, what's the news from Venice? How doth that royal merchant, good Antonio? I know he will be glad of our success. We are the Jasons, we have won the fleece. I would you had won the fleece that he hath lost. There are some shrewd contents in yon same paper that steal the color from Bassanio's cheek. Some dear friend dead, else nothing in the world could turn so much the constitution of any constant man. What, worse and worse! With leave, Bassanio, I am half yourself, and I must freely have the half of anything that this same paper brings you. Oh, sweet Portia, here are a few of the unpleasantest words that ever blotted paper. Gentle lady, when I did first impart my love to you, I freely told you all the wealth I had ran in my veins. I was a gentleman. And then I told you true, and yet, dear lady, Rating myself at nothing, you shall see how much I was a braggart. When I told you my state was nothing, I should then have told you that I was worse than nothing. For indeed I have engaged myself to a dear friend, engaged my friend to his mere enemy to feed my means. Here is a letter, lady. The paper has the body of my friend, and every word in it a gaping wound issuing life-blood. But is it true, Solario? Have all his ventures failed? What, not one hit? From Tripolis? From Mexico and England? From Lisbon, Barbary, and India? And not one vessel scaped the dreadful touch of merchant-marring rocks? Not one, my lord. Besides, it should appear that if he had the present money to discharge the Jew, he would not take it. Never did I know a creature that did bear the shape of man so keen and greedy to confound a man. He plies the duke at morning and at night, and doth impeach the freedom of the state if they deny him justice. 
Twenty merchants of the Duke himself, and the Magnificos of greatest port, have all persuaded with him, but none can drive him from the envious plea of forfeiture, of justice and his bond. When I was with him, I have heard him swear to Tybal and to choose his countrymen, that he would rather have Antonio's flesh than twenty times the value of the sum that he did owe him. And I know, my lord, if law, authority, and power deny not, it will go hard with poor Antonio. Is it your dear friend that is thus in trouble? The dearest friend to me, the kindest man, the best conditioned and unwearied spirit in doing courtesies, and one in whom the ancient Roman honor more appears than any that draws breath in Italy. What sum owes he the Jew? For me three thousand ducats. What, no more? Pay him six thousand and deface the bond. Double six thousand, and then treble that, before a friend of this description shall lose a hair through Bassanio's fault. First go with me to church and call me wife, and then away to Venice to your friend, for never shall you lie by Portia's side with an unquiet soul. You shall have gold to pay the petty debt twenty times over. When it is paid, bring your true friend along. My maid Nerissa and myself, meantime, will live as maids and widows. Come, away, for you shall hence upon your wedding day. Bid your friends welcome, show a merry cheer. Since you are dear bought, I will love you dear. But let me hear the letter of your friend. Sweet Bassanio, my ships have all miscarried. My creditors grow cruel. My estate is very low. My bond to the Jew is forfeit. And since in paying it, it is impossible I should live. All debts are cleared between you and I, if I might but see you at my death. Notwithstanding, use your pleasure. If your love do not persuade you to come, let not my letter. Oh, love, dispatch all business and be gone. Since I have your good leave to go away, I will make haste. But till I come again, no bed shall e'er be guilty of my stay. No rest be interposer twixt us twain. Exeunt. Scene three. Venice, a street. Enter Shylock, Salarino, Antonio, and Jailer. Jailer, look to him. Tell me not of mercy. This is the fool that lent out money gratis. Jailer, look to him. Hear me yet, good Shylock. I'll have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. Thou callest me dog before thou hadst a cause. But since I am a dog, beware my fangs. The duke shall grant me justice. I do wonder, thou naughty jailer, that thou art so fond to come abroad with him at his request. I pray thee, hear me speak. I'll have my bond. I'll not hear thee speak. I'll have my bond, and therefore speak no more. I'll not be made a soft and dull-eyed fool To shake the head, relent, and sigh, And yield to Christian intercessors. Follow not. I'll have no speaking. I will have my bond. Exit. It is the most impenetrable cur that ever kept with men. Let him alone. I'll follow him no more with bootless prayers. He seeks my life. His reason well I know. I oft delivered from his forfeitures many that have at times made moan to me. Therefore he hates me. I am sure the Duke will never grant this forfeiture to hold. The Duke cannot deny the course of law. For the commodity that strangers have with us in Venice, if it be denied, it will much impeach the justice of the state, since that the trade and profit of the city consisteth of all nations. Therefore go. These griefs and losses have so baited me that I shall hardly spare a pound of flesh tomorrow to my bloody creditor. Well, Gowler, on. Pray God, Bassanio come to see me pay his debt, and then I care not. Exeunt. Scene 4. Belmont, a room in Portia's house. Enter Portia, Nerissa, Lorenzo, Jessica, 
and Balthasar. Madam, although I speak it in your presence, you have a noble and a true conceit of godlike amity, which appears most strongly in bearing thus the absence of your lord. But if you knew to whom you show this honor, how true a gentleman you send relief, how dear a lover of my lord your husband, I know you would be prouder of the work than customary bounty can enforce you. I never did repent for doing good, nor shall not now. For in companions that do converse and waste the time together, whose souls do bear an equal yoke of love, there must be needs a like proportion of lineaments, of manners, and of spirit. Which makes me think that this Antonio, being the bosom lover of my lord, must needs be like my lord. If it be so, how little is the cost I have bestowed in purchasing the semblance of my soul from out the state of hellish cruelty. This comes too near the praising of myself, therefore no more of it. Hear other things. Lorenzo, I commit into your hands the husbandry and manage of my house until my lord's return. For mine own part, I have toward heaven breathed a secret vow to live in prayer and contemplation, only attended by Nerissa here, until her husband and my lord's return. There is a monastery two miles off, and there we will abide. I do desire you not to deny this imposition, the which my love and some necessity now lays upon you. Madam, with all my heart I shall obey you in all fair commands. My people do already know my mind, and will acknowledge you and Jessica in place of Lord Bassanio and myself. So fare you well till we shall meet again. Fair thoughts and happy hours attend on you. I wish your ladyship all heart's content. I thank you for your wish, and am well pleased to wish it back on you. Fare you well, Jessica. Exeunt. Jessica and Lorenzo. Now, Balthazar, as I have ever found thee honest true, so let me find thee still. Take this same letter, and use thou all the endeavor of a man in speed to Padua. See thou render this into my cousin's hands, Dr. Bellario, and look what notes and garments he doth give thee. Bring them, I pray thee, with imagined speed unto the tragic, to the common fairy which trades to Venice. Waste no time in words, but get thee gone. I shall be there before thee. Madam, I go with all convenient speed. Exit. Come on, Nerissa. I have work in hand that you yet know not of. We'll see our husbands before they think of us. Shall they see us? They shall, Nerissa, but in such a habit that they shall think we are accomplished with that we lack. I'll hold thee any wager. When we are both accoutred like young men, I'll prove the prettier fellow of the two, and wear my dagger with the braver grace, and speak between the change of man and boy with a reed voice, and turn two mincing steps into a manly stride, and speak of phrase like a fine bragging youth, and tell quaint lies, how honorable ladies sought my love, which I denying they fell sick and died. I could not do withal. Then I'll repent, and wish for all that, that I had not killed them. And twenty of these puny lies I'll tell, that men shall swear I have discontinued school about a twelve-month. I have within my mind a thousand raw tricks of these bragging jacks, which I will practice. Why, so it tend to men? Fie! What a question's that, if thou wert near a lewd interpreter? But come, I'll tell thee all my whole device when I am in my coach, which stays for us at the park gate and therefore haste away, for we must measure twenty miles to-day. Exeunt. Scene five. The same. A garden. Enter Launcelot and Jessica. Yes, truly. For look you, the sins of the father are to be laid upon the children. Therefore I promise you, I fear you. And I was always plain with you. And so now I speak my agitation of the matter. Therefore be good of cheer, for truly I think you are damned. There is but one hope in it that can do you any good, and that is but a kind of bastard hope neither. And what hope is that, I pray thee? Mary, you may partly hope that your father got you not, that you are not the Jew's daughter. That were a kind of bastard hope indeed, 
so the sins of my mother should be visited upon me. Truly, then, I fear you are damned, both by father and mother. Thus, when I shun Scylla, your father, I fall into Charybdis, your mother. Well, you are gone both ways. I shall be saved by my husband. He hath made me a Christian. Truly, the more to blame he. We were Christians and now before, e'en as many as could well live one by another. This making of Christians will raise the price of hogs. If we grow all to be pork-eaters, we shall not shortly have a rasher on the coals for money. I'll tell my husband, Launcelot, what you say. Here he comes. Enter Lorenzo. I shall grow jealous of you shortly, Launcelot, if you thus get my wife into corners. Nay, you need not fear us, Lorenzo. Launcelot and I are out. He tells me flatly there is no mercy for me in heaven because I am a Jew's daughter. And he says you are no good member of the commonwealth, for in converting Jews to Christians you raise the price of pork. I shall answer that better to the commonwealth than you can the getting up of the negro's belly. The moor is with child by you, Launcelot. It is much that the moor should be more than reason. But if she be less than an honest woman, she is indeed more than I took her for. How every fool can play upon the word. I think the best grace of wit will shortly turn into silence, and discourse grow commendable in none only but parrots. Go in, Sarah. Bid them prepare for dinner. That is done, sir. They have all stomachs. Goodly lord, what a wit-snapper are you? Then bid them prepare dinner. That is done too, sir. Only cover is the word. Will you cover then, sir? Not so, sir. Neither. I know my duty. Yet more quarreling with occasion. Wilt thou show the whole wealth of thy wit in an instant? I pray thee understand a plain man in his plain meaning. Go to thy fellows, bid them cover the table, serve in the meat, and we will come in to dinner. For the table, sir, it shall be served in. For the meat, sir, it should be covered. For your coming in to dinner, sir, why, let it be as humors and conceits shall govern. Exit. Oh, dear discretion, how his words are suited. The fool hath planted in his memory. An army of good words, and I do know a many fools that stand in better place, garnished like him, that for a tricksy word defy the matter. How cheerest thou, Jessica? And now, good sweet, say thy opinion, how dost thou like the Lord Bassanio's wife? Past all expressing. It is very meet the Lord Bassanio live an upright life, for having such a blessing in his lady, he finds the joys of heaven here on earth. And if on earth he do not merit it, in reason he should never come to heaven. Why, if two gods should play some heavenly match, and on the wager lay two earthly women, and Portia one, there must be something else pawned with the other, for the poor rude world hath not her fellow." Even such a husband hath thou of me, as she is for a wife. Nay, but ask my opinion, too, of that. I will, Anon. First let us go to dinner. Nay, let me praise you while I have a stomach. No, pray thee, let it serve for table talk. Then, howsoe'er thou speakest, mong other things, I shall digest it. Well, I'll set you forth. Exeunt. End of Act Three, 